So still working on 7.3. Like I said, most of um, the Chapter 7 material will be like two-day sections. Uh, there might be a time when, like tomorrow, we're supposed to have safety day. That's where we talk about the fire um, fire drill information. We're actually not going to go out. We're just going to talk about the fire drill information and uh, the Alice safety information. So that I may have to put a little bit more on to Friday, but we'll see how it goes, and we'll see how long all of that takes. So multivariate linear systems and row operations. We're continuing our work on this. Um, one of the things that we found out right at the end of the day is that that our REF button is going to be really great. You know, uh, reduced row echelon form gives us those solutions. And then today we have to talk about using inverses and applying matrices to model and solve real-world applications. And it doesn't sound like a long list, but you know we've got different different things to look at today. You know, situations that end up being kind of goofy because yesterday we saw stuff that worked out really nice, and today is more about hey, this isn't working out the same way the other problems did. Uh -oh. There it is. All right, so finding infinitely many solutions is they're kind of telling you the punchline before they tell you the joke here. We're supposed to solve the system. Obviously, something strange is going to happen here that we're going to notice. So first thing we have to do by hand is figure out what the augmented matrix would look like. So we take all those coefficients. and put those in the coefficient matrix part. And then we put the augmented piece, which is, of course, those answers that we have over on the right-hand side. I'm going to double check that real quick, making sure everything's on there that I need. And because we now know that the calculator will solve this for us quickly, what we're going to do is find that reduced row echelon version of that matrix. All right, so that means we're going to put it in. Put it in our calculator and find that RREF. Second matrix. Everything is really slow on the computer today. Edit. And it is a three row, four columns. Again, go ahead and put those in. And I'm going to take an extra second to make sure it grabbed my negative this time, because yesterday it didn't do that on the last example. All right, it's all in there. So once you have it all in, you have to go back to the main screen to get the calculator to execute what you want. So that's going to be second matrix. We tend to use reduced row echelon form a lot. So when you get over here, you know, you kind of want a shortcut because it's all the way down at the bottom. Well, if you're in this position and you know that it's B, you can always hit alpha B and then it'll pop up. You know, it kind of becomes a little shortcut for you. And then second math, number one. And there it is. And hopefully when you're looking at it, you're saying, yeah, something goofy is going on with this one. So the something goofy, third row. And we need to take a look at what this really means because remember, wherever we have those ones and the numbers that represent them, this is column for x, column for y's, column for z's. And we realize, well, the last one doesn't have any variables down there. It's just going to say 0 equals 0, which typically we would write down infinitely many solutions for. And that's not wrong.
but that was last year in Algebra 2. So this year what we want to do is say, well, let's at least give them something. I mean, if this is in the real world, they need this information. I mean, that's why they put all this in here. So if nothing else, we could give them a formula to figure out what's going on. So we do have equations sitting here. This one says x, if I can find some space here, x plus 0y plus 3z equals 5. And the middle one, no x's, but we have a y minus 2z equals negative 2. So what I realize here is z is the one you can put whatever you want in for. That's the one that created the 0 equals 0. So in the little formula that we're going to give them for this ordered triple, the first thing we're going to do is say, z is yours. Whatever you want to use for z, use. But there is a formula available to figure out what y would need to be. And there is a formula available to figure out what x would be. So all we do is solve this first equation for x. Now, in fancy you know, function notation, that is an equation for x in terms of z. So now in the x position here, we're going to put negative 3z plus 5. If they pick a z, they can get a little formula here to get the x for them. Same thing for the y. Add 2z to both sides. Because if this is a business situation, obviously they're producing some z somehow. And what they do is say, well, since we get to pick, let's just choose a z value. We would want them to be able to quickly figure out what x's and what y's they should make if they know what that z value is. And that's how we do it. Come up with a little formula for them. So it is infinitely many. So those zeros are supposed to be a great big hint to us that, yeah, there's, there's something going on here where the zero equals zero. All right, using matrices. We can solve systems of equations with more than three variables and more than three equations by finding a row or reduced row echelon form. The solution set may become more complicated. So again, this is going to give us a big hint that we're finding infinitely many solutions for at least one of the variables here. And if that's the case, we're going to have to go back to writing formulas like we did in the last one. So let's go ahead and write down our augmented matrix before we plop it into the calculator. That's where we're going to go with it. We're going to put it in the calculator. So let's go ahead and use the RREF. So we're editing, but this time we have a 3 by 5. Go ahead and get the numbers in. Looks like it took all my negatives. Back to the main screen. Second matrix, math, alpha B. Second matrix, number one. Enter. And there we get our solution. 
So let's see if I can move this up enough where I can write it and see it at the same time. After we do a lot of matrices, we would know in advance that this one is going to have something weird happening. And the reason is, we don't have enough matrix to give us a solution to this. If we have four variables, typically you'll need a four by four matrix in order to solve for all of it. So something goofy was going to happen here anyway. And in this last row, we again see our zero equals zero, which does mean infinitely many. But again, because this would be applied to something, we can't just leave it at that. So we have to say, all right, let's see what we have. We have this first equation here, which would be x plus 0y plus z plus 2w equals 1. And then the second one doesn't have an x. It has y minus 2z minus w equals negative 1. So... What happened to Z and W? Well, this time they get to pick both of those. Those two things are wide open to them. So when we end this, we want to let them know. You, know. you get to choose whatever your Z and W is. But there are formulas here to figure out what X is and what Y is. We just have to solve the top one for X and solve the bottom one for Y. So basically, you're just moving them over with those inverse operations. And then we're going to put them in their positions that they would be in in our little pack of 4 here. So we'd have negative z minus 2w plus 1 and 2z plus w minus 1. So they get to pick the z and the w, but there are formulas to help guide them to figure out what they need to use with those Z and W variables. Again, matrices often used in business, um, they're trying to figure out where they should produce either to make the biggest profit or to have the least amount of costs. And there's a lot of things involved in that. I mean, even when you just think about your own house and all the costs that are associated with that, you know, garbage removal, water, sewer, electricity, gas, you know, all of those types of things. So there are a lot of variables in, in our real world. Now, I really like our RAF, reduced row echelon form, but there are other ways to solve, and we have to know those other ways as well because certain situations are better suited to reduce row echelon versus inverse matrices. So we want to see how inverse matrices work as well. If a linear system consists of the same number of equations as variables, then the coefficient matrix is square. And with square matrices, inverses work out really nicely. Exactly. Exactly. That's our hope, that we can get an answer for all five of them, but it requires a square matrix to get that. So when those rectangles showed up in the last two, when we know we're not going to have a square matrix, something goofy is, is going to happen with those. So if a linear system consists the same number of equations as variables, then the coefficient matrix is square. And we can test those to figure out whether or not they're singular or not. Remember, that's our determinant. So if they're non-singular, so their determinant is not equal to 0, well, then we can solve the system using the inverse of the matrix. Now, what's kind of nice about this is, especially with the 2 by 2s, we can do some of this by hand. 
with reduced row echelon form, when we put it in the graphing calculator, we are handing over the problem to the graphing calculator. To grade it, it really becomes about, did they put it in the calculator right? I mean, that's it. And of course, that's not what this course is supposed to be about. We're supposed to be using algebraic methods to solve these and using that graphing calculator to check. So this one says, we're going to solve a system using inverse matrices. And this takes us back to where they first started saying, if you want to make a matrix, start with your coefficient matrix. So just the numbers that are in front of your x's and y's. We're going to call that A. Now, we know algebra if we can set up an equation. So what we would do is realize that these, 3x minus 2y equals 0 and negative x plus y equals 5, those two equations that make up the system came from multiplying, we'll call this matrix x, by matrix x, which was xy. And we can test that out because we can take row 1 times column 1, 3x minus 2y, negative x plus y. There it is. That's how they got it. And when they did that, they came up with matrix B, which is 0, 5. And this helps us see the algebra that we could use for this, because this would be ax equals b, and pretty obviously we're trying to find x and y. Well, that matrix is matrix x. The one problem we have is that with matrices, you have to multiply on the same side. So if I want to solve this for x, I have to multiply on the left by A inverse, which means over here, I'm going to have to move my little B over. So I can multiply from the left-hand side. Because multiplying from the left and right with matrices does not give you the same answer. So once we've done that, these two are going to cancel out, A inverse times A. And we just have to multiply A inverse times B to get our matrix answer that we need for this. So A inverse, let's do that first. It's been a couple of days since we talked about the determinant and all that. So to find the inverse, we have to make sure that the determinant is not going to be 0. So make your big X. 3 times 1 is 3. Negative 2 times 1 is 2. 3 minus 2 is 1. So we can actually do this math. And then to find an inverse, we had to take 1 over the determinant, which in this case would be 1 over 1. And then we have to switch on the main diagonal and negate on the secondary diagonal. Well, if we just multiply by 1, that's not going to change this matrix. It's still going to be 1, 2, 1, 3. So now what I want to do is take this inverse matrix, times b. And since it's a 2 by 2 and a 2 by 1, I think about those for a second and realize, well, that's going to work because the two inside numbers are 2 and 2, and the two outside numbers are 2 by 1. So I could actually make this a little smaller here. But that'll give me my answers that I need. So then it's row 1 times column 1, and add those up. 0 plus 10 is 10. And then row 2, column 1, 0 plus 15 is 15. So there's our ordered pair in matrix form. And then we just want to write it as an ordered pair. So by hand, we can use matrices to solve it. I know you'd look at that and say, well, that was kind of a long way because that one would go much faster if we just used substitution or elimination. You're absolutely right but we're applying what we've learned in the past to our matrices. So linear equations. If a and b are real numbers with a not equal to 0, the linear equation ax equals b has a unique solution, and we'd use the inverses to find that. And that's what we're doing here with matrices, but remembering 
that if I multiply on the left-hand side over here, I have to multiply on the left-hand side over there because matrices are not commutative. We can't just switch them and go from right to left. It, it doesn't work that way. So once we get our answer, we put it back in the form that we know it should be in, which would be an ordered pair. So there it is. Now, if we're going to use this, typically we use these for the larger ones. Again, uh, this absolutely could show up as a problem on your non-calculator portion for the Chapter 7 test. We don't have a lot of things so far that are going to be non-calculator, so this would be a good one. It shows that you understand how to find determinant, how to find the inverse, and then how to use that with multiplication. So this theorem here says invertible square linear systems. Let A be the coefficient matrix of the system of n linear equations and n variables given in the form matrix A times matrix X equals matrix B, where X is an n by 1. So this is a column matrix, um, whatever rows we have, but one column, matrix of variables. And B is an n by 1 matrix of numbers on the right-hand side of the equation. If the inverse exists, so that's the big one, we have to know the determinant is in 0, then the system of equations will have this solution, x equals a inverse times b. Again, you cannot reverse a inverse and b and make it b a inverse. Multiplying from the left is important. All right, so this one says we're going to go bigger. Solving a system using inverse matrices. So again, we need an a, which will be just the coefficients. So go ahead and write that one down. And then we want that column matrix for x that is just the x's, y's, and z's. And then our b, another column matrix with just the numbers on the right-hand side. So now, I think about what's going on here. This is my AX equals B. And the fact that I'm going to have to multiply on the left by my matrix, my inverse matrix. So I start thinking calculator-wise. Well, I'm going to have to put matrix A in there, but I'm also going to have to put matrix B in there because I'm going to have to recall matrix A, get its inverse, and multiply it by B. So both matrices have to go in this time. So clear that out of their second matrix. What do we have? We've got a 3 by 3 for the first one. And go ahead and put those in. Once you have A in, you can back out and come back in, but make sure you don't overwrite matrix A. We need that one, but we also need matrix B. Got them in? You hang on here. You might already be going through it because we did use the inverse button the other day, so I know you already know where that is. Everybody have all their numbers in? Alrighty, so recall the name of matrix A and hit the inverse button times recall the name of matrix B. Shoot. Punching too quick. There. So there's our answer.
So x, y, and z is what we were looking for. Let me move this up. And we've already learned that improper fractions, we'd rather have those than writing mixed numbers down. So if you didn't want to do 39 and a third in your noggin, you could put it in as 39 plus parentheses 1 divided by 3. Let the calculator digest it. Math number 1, enter. Let it spit it back out as a fraction. You know, Then you wouldn't even have to do that part in your head. Get that 118 thirds. So this one at least has a little bit of work that you could show me before you grab the graphing calculator and punch it in. Now, you'll notice with this one, I didn't stop to figure out whether or not it had a determinant or not. And that's because if we hit A inverse in the calculator and it doesn't have a determinant, it's going to let us know. It'll yell at us, error, you know, determinant is zero. So it'll, it'll give that information to us. We don't have to stop and say, well, let's just make sure the determinant's not zero first before we go on. So with the larger ones, you can get away with that. All right. We're solving our two by twos, our three by threes. Applications. Any three non-collinear points with distinct x coordinates determine exactly one second degree polynomial. The graph of a second degree polynomial is a parabola. Now, what that means is, if we have three points we know are part of a parabola, we can get it exact. We can get an equation that's perfect for those three points. It's just a matter of how do we want to do it. Because back in Algebra 2, we taught you one method for it. Now we're going to say, hey, let's, let's think about this in terms of matrices. So it says, determine A, B, and C so that the points negative 1, 5, 2, negative 1, and 3, 13 are actually on this graph. So we'd have a, a parabola. This is our standard equation, our standard form for a parabola. So I start thinking, what this really means is, if I put negative 1 into the function, I'm going to get 5. What this really means is, if I put a 2 in, I'm going to get a negative 1. And the last one, if I put a 3 in, I'm going to get a 13. Now why is that important? Because I'm supposed to use ax squared plus bx plus c, and the only thing they've given me are x's and y's. Well, that's okay, because that'll help me set up a system of three variables that I could solve with my graphing calculator. So we're going to go ahead and put negative 1 in for x. And know that it has to come out to be 5. But we'll simplify it a little bit. So negative 1 squared is 1. So 1a minus b plus c equals 5. So there's our first equation. We just need to do that two more times. So for the second one, we're going to put a 2 in for x. And it will give us a negative 1 as a result. So we get 4a plus 2b plus c equals negative 1. And then we'll put a 3 in. look at the three resulting equations and I realize, well, we just did that. I mean, if we can get a coefficient matrix, we can use inverses here. We could use reduced row echelon form. Nowhere in the problem did it say that we had to use one versus the other. Over here, they show a inverse times b, so that's probably how I'll punch it in. But we certainly could use reduced row, row echelon form also. So let's get our coefficient matrix.
There's our little ABC matrix. And then we have 5, negative 1, and 13 for our B matrix. And again, we understand that our little equation to solve is AX equals B. So we'll have to multiply by A inverse on the left side. All right. Calculator time again. So we still have a 3 by 3 coefficient matrix. Since I'm handing it over to the calculator, I'm going to double check everything is good. Go in and edit B. Still a 3 by 1. And then use your main screen to pull up A inverse times B. And there's our answer. All right, so now we have to figure out what our answer was supposed to look like. And it says, determine A, B, and C so that the points are on the graph of f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So what I'd want to do at this point is actually write the equation for the parabola. And over here, they superimposed the graph of y equals 4x squared minus 6x minus 5 on those three points. And it goes through them perfectly. And that's what we're after. We want to find the equation to make that work out perfectly through those three points. So that's how we get an equation for a parabola, much differently than the way that you did last year when you were working in Algebra 2 using those matrices. But so far, so good? Making sense? OK. Because now is when I find out if you could kind of do that stuff on your own by looking at this mixing solutions problem. So Eileen's drugstore needs to prepare a 60-liter mixture that is 40% acid using three concentrations of acid. They got an order in, and they look up at the shelf, and none of the mixtures that they have for acid are at the right percentage. So they've got 15% acid, 35% acid, and 55% acid. They don't want to run out of any of them, so they're kind of hoping they could use all three to make this mixture that's 40%. Because of the amounts of acid on hand, they need to use twice as much of the 35% solution as the 55% solution. And in the end, we want to figure out how much of each solution should they use. So we're going to start here. Let x equal the number of liters of 15% solution used. y is going to be the 35%. And z is going to be the 55%. So in number one, they're giving us the equation and I'd like somebody to help out and tell us where it came from. Explain how the equation x plus y plus c equals 60 is related to this problem. Why would that be one of the equations we would need? Greta? of each of those, right, that they have to use for it. Yeah. So the number of liters of each type of acid that they have must total 60.
So that equation is all about liters. You know, what, how much of each of these are we going to have to use to make this work? All right, new equation. Explain how the equation 0.15x plus 0.35y plus 0.55z equals 24 is related to the problem. So in particular, because I'm pretty sure it's going to be easy for you to see why the x, y, and z are the way they are, but try to figure out where they got the 24 from. Got it, Isabel? Exactly. Now, it takes a little while to remember what's going on here. Percentage times amount, percentage times amount, percentage times amount. And we want percentage times amount. So there it is. So this is going to give us, explain how that equation is related. It uses the percentages. to get a result of 24 liters of acid. So that's the portion of it that's going to be acid when they get done. Three feels a little weird, considering that we looked at those other and they all, they all had all the variables that we needed. Explain how the equation y equals 2z is related to the problem. So where did that come from? Try to read through the problem again. Found it, Greta? Yeah, that has to be it. Has to be it. It's the only thing we have up there that deals with that too. So again, this is how much they have on hand. They need twice as much. 35% solution as the 55% solution. But I look at that and I think, well, that's not going to fit in nicely with our other equations. First of all, there's supposed to be a number on one side. You're supposed to have the x's and y's and z's all lined up just like these are and a number on the other side. Well, that's not a big deal. We'll just subtract 2z from both sides and put a 0 on the other side. Yeah, we're missing a w, but we can put a 0 in for w. Which brings us to this one, which is write the system of three equations attained from part one through three in the form AX equals B, where A is your coefficient matrix of the system, and then we'll solve it with the inverses like we've been doing. All right, first equation was X plus Y plus Z equals 60. So one, one, one for coefficient matrix. Second one, 0.15x plus 0.35y plus 0.55z. So those percentage concentrations. And then the last one we had y minus 2z equals 0. So 0x, 1y, negative 2z. And again, that's our matrix A. Our matrix X, they did use X, Y's, and Z's for those. And then our matrix B is going to be what we consider the answers, you know, the numbers on the other side. And that was 60, 24, and 0. So there they are. 5 says, well, now solve it. So, yeah, we're going to grab a calculator and we're going to solve it. Try to get this where I can see everything. 
before I punch it in. Second matrix edit. Still a three by three, but definitely our numbers have changed. Oh, I didn't take one of my numbers. That's better. negative two. That's better. Back to your main screen. A inverse times B. And there we have it. So it's all solved. All we have left for number six is to write them a sentence telling them what this means. They should mix. Help me out. What's the 3.75 for? They should mix 3.75 liters of the 15% solution. What else? That was 35 men. The 35% was the 37.5 liters. Yeah, middle one. I don't want to scroll back up. And last chunk. How do we finish it? There it is. So they're kind of leading us through, you know, how do we set this up? What are we finding? As that will give them their 60 liters of 40% acid solution. And we're done. So you will be able to do those now. So like I said, tomorrow we'll talk about the safety day stuff, and then we're going to start using something that, for those of you that are going to go to calculus next year, you're, you're going to use next year called partial fractions.